It's time to fight. You may say, I came to church in my pretty church clothes and I'm here, I'm not looking for trouble. I don't want to fight. Unless you're Jewel Walker, I believe you. <laughs> I'm just picking, I'm picking. <clears throat> but Moses told Joshua in Exodus 17, when they were under attack, I love you, Miss Jewel. Um, he told Joshua to get some men and to fight. Exodus chapter 17, if you can turn there. You can tell I'm getting old too. <laughs> Exodus 17, Pastor Tim preached from this two weeks ago, but just to recap, let's read from verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us thirst? to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Walk on ahead of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And now the passage for today. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim, Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But when he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him and sat on it, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, For the Lord, where hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. With the Lord's help this morning, I'd like to share from this passage who we're supposed to fight, how to fight, and why to fight. The first one is very important. If you had been dropped in from outer space to, to see what was happening in the first part of Exodus 17, you would have guessed that the number one enemy of the Israelite people was Moses because the people were fighting him so hard. So much that he prayed to God because he thought they were going to stone him. But Moses really wasn't their enemy. You never want to be a fight, fighting against someone who isn't your enemy. I learned this lesson in the first grade, believe it or not. I was in detention, as usual. All the other kids were playing outside at recess. Urania Elementary, right now we're... 
Kobe and I were raised up not too far from each other, believe, uh, um, Allah and Tullis. And I was in Urania Elementary, laying on my stomach in the hallway, pretending to do my punish work. And Amy McDaniel came skipping down the hall, smiling, laughing at me. And she got close to me. She kicked me right in the ribs, those pointy toe shoes. And the longer I laid there, the more it hurt, the madder I got. Although I couldn't play at recess, I could always line up when the bell rang. And I was Dylan Morse, and she's Amy McDaniel. And I walked up to her, Colby, to my shame. She's smiling at me like I'm her best friend, and I punched her in the face. <laughs> I dropped her like a bad habit. It was terrible. And if I just stopped right there, I'm already the worst person you know. But it's worse than that. Amy McDaniel had a, has a twin sister, identical twin, Angie McDaniel, and that's who I hit. About that time, I felt Mrs. Smith, my first grade teacher, reach up and grab my ear. She was a midget. She was the strongest woman I knew, and she dragged me by my ear all the way to the office. The principal heard what I did, and he grabbed that paddle, had holes drilled in it, a duct tape handle, and he beat me like an old rug. I got home. My dad whipped me with a belt. My mom hit me with what she had handy. My sisters chewed me out. My grandpa prayed for me like I had a devil. I never hit a girl since. I really didn't want to tell that story this morning. But you know, I believe that a lot of times pastors feel kind of like Angie McDaniel. Somebody just comes up and punches them in the face, and they're like, where did that come from? Moses was not the enemy of God's people. And can I just tell you, we have an enemy, and it's not your pastor. I know there's exceptions. There's some terrible people, Jim Jones. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about most people who surrender to the ministry, love God, and they love you. And they may not be perfect, but they're not your enemy. Who is your enemy? The Bible says that the enemy is our flesh, that the flesh wars against the spirit. The Bible says that the enemy is the world, and if you have friendship with the world, it's enmity with God. The Bible says that the devil is our enemy. In John chapter 10, verse 10, and Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and life abundantly. I like the version that says life to the full. Peter says, be vigilant and be alert, be sober-minded. Because the devil is like a roaring lion. He prowls like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's a predator. And he's taking aim at each person here. And his plan is to destroy you. The people who were fighting God's people, the Amalekites, the real enemy, they were like predators. Deuteronomy 25 says that the Amalekites came in and they cut off the tail of the caravan. And those people who were following from the Red Sea, the weakest, the slowest, the crippled, that fell behind the group and got separated, the Amalekites would come in like a predator, separating them from the herd, and they would kill them. And God hated them for it. And now, when God's people are in a place that's a dry, thirsty land, the Amalekites decide to attack full, full on. They had a real enemy, and we do too. But how do we fight? How do you fight the world? How do you fight your flesh? How do you fight the devil? And you can't do it in your own power. You can't do it by yourself. It's a spiritual battle. Second Corinthians chapter 1 for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Ephesians chapter 6. Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the attacks of the wicked. It's a spiritual battle. You can't get enough guns and ammo. You can't get the strongest people or the strongest armies in the world to fight evil. It doesn't work that way. We are not at war against a people group. There's not a human in the world that you're called to have war upon. Jesus said that my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my followers would have fought. But we are called to fight a spiritual battle. And we're called to fight in prayer. Ephesians 6, as soon as he finishes putting on the, the armor of God, he says, put the helmet of salvation, put the breastplate of righteousness, tie that belt of truth on, put your shoes, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, by which you can extinguish the fiery darts of the devil, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And as soon as Paul gets finished getting you all dressed up for war, what does he say? Pray all the time in the spirit. Make supplications for all the saints. He gets you dressed up for war, and he marches you right into the prayer room. That's our battlefield. That's where we're supposed to pray. The Amalekites did not expect God to fight them. They, they were opportunists. They assumed that the people of Israel were, were dying of thirst because there was no water. They probably could hear them arguing from a mile away. They didn't think that Moses was going to get a commandment from God to strike a rock and that the rock would, wash, would gush forth with water. They would not have dreamed of that one in the desert. They didn't think that these slaves, former slaves, were going to fight like soldiers. They didn't think that Moses was going to be able to stand over the top of them and call down the power of God for them to win. It was a supernatural victory. And the Bible says in this chapter that God himself fought against them. We can't fight in our own power. On your best day, you're not going to make it. On your best day, you're not going to be strong enough. My son Jonah is here. He, he brought home his report card. It was all A's, one B and one F. I said, what happened? What, what's with this? He said, but daddy, that was a high F. It was almost a D. Can I tell you, on your best day, in all your strength, you're going to get a high F. Maybe, if you're lucky. But God, God will fight your battles. We don't have Joshua to go before us and fight as a general. But we sing the song here, and the word says, I know who goes before me, and I know who stands behind me. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Have you all heard that song? It's a chapter, in a chapter and verse first. The guy, her, turns out is not a girl. That's a joke. All we know about him is that he walked up on that hill, and he held Moses' hand and helped him for one day. But he's not here to help you anymore. But Jesus said, I'm going to pray to the Father, and he's going to send a comforter. He's going to send a counselor. He's going to send a helper, the spirit of truth, the spirit of Christ. For he has not given us as a spirit that makes us a slave again under fear, but the spirit of adoption, the spirit of sonship didn't give us a spirit of fear, but the spirit of power and love and a sound mind. We have the Holy Spirit to help us. I know that Moses was called the deliverer of the people. But the truth is, Moses never made it to the promised land. He messed up. He got buried before they could walk into Canaan. But we have a deliverer who never messed up. We have a deliverer who will take us all the way through. Moses held up that staff, and the people of God prevailed. But Jesus raised up his arms. And that's where our victory comes from. It's not from our own power. Amen.
Aaron was the high priest. He was standing there next to Moses. Aaron had the job after this becoming the high priest. He would go to all the people when they had sinned. He would bring their sins before God, and he was the mediator. He would intercede, Lord, spare these people. But Aaron's not here to help us anymore. But the Bible says that Jesus, our great high priest, that he always lives to make intercession for us. You guys may laugh. I go back and forth. I'll read the ESV and I'll translate it to King James and say it all in one second. I don't know. I was raised up reading King James Version. So the King James says, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. What does that mean? What that means is no matter how bad you've messed up, no matter what your sin is, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. And as long as Jesus is alive, that's true. That's pretty good odds. The Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. You can't fight in your own power. None of us can but we are still called to fight. Why are we called to fight? Let me tell you the simplicity of the answer. We're called to fight for each other. Maybe a little bit of a curveball because everyone thinks, well, I've got my own battles. I've got my own demons. And it's just between me and God. And, and, and that's not the word. Galatians 6 says, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual, restore them. Bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ, Colby? What did he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, when Moses told Joshua to fight, Joshua said, yeah, Moses, I'll go fight for you. When Moses went to fight, he said, I'm going to go fight for the people. When Aaron and Hur went to fight, they said, I'm going to fight for Moses. I'm going to go help him up there on that hill. Joshua called out men. Who's willing to fight? And they said, yes, Joshua, we'll go fight for you. Nobody was just fighting for themselves. No one. No one. We're not just in a self-defense here in the church, in the army of the Lord. We're called to lift one another up. We're called to bear one another's burdens. the law of Christ, but somehow we've gotten this idea from our culture and from the world that it's just, there are people who will videotape you if you're on fire and they won't help you. Am I telling the truth? That's not what the body of Christ is supposed to be. We're supposed to bear one another's burdens. We're supposed to help each other when we're under attack, just like Moses' arms that were heavy. And they were standing on both sides of him. Just a few days ago, Eli was in the woods cutting trees down with a machete because I'm raising my kids right. This is my family over here, Jonah, Eli, and the beautiful pianist, Dana. Eli was cutting bushes with a machete. I was working on my truck at the shop. Dana was tending to the chickens. Jonah, I don't know what he was doing, in the yard. And Eli got into some yellow jackets. Wasp, I don't know what, whatever it was, he started screaming. You know how every time they bite you, you scream again. <clears throat> Starts running from them, holding a machete. Very dangerous. I ran. There was no trail to get me straight to him. So I made a trail through the woods. By the time I got to him, I was bleeding like a stuck pig. Dana was in the chicken coop. She flew the coop. <laughs> she ran to him. She, she was there before I was. I get over there, and she had already pulled. I don't know what happened to the machete. The machete was gone. She was pulling the shirt off, had bees on it. She threw it on the ground. Jonah's stomping on top of the shirt, jumping on it. Why would we do that? Why would we run toward a swarm of bees or wasps and a wild-eyed kid with a machete. 
because we love that little booger. That's why. Someone's being overtaken in a sin. If someone's going through a battle, we got to help them. We got to hold them up. You know, this church has done that too. I will say our church is good about that. When Eli was born, he was born early, 72 days in the NICU. And Dana and I, you know, we're, we're trusting God. God, you got this. After 72 days, your arms start getting weaker. And the devil's tempting you, saying he's not coming home. This church filled up our refrigerator. This church paid some house notes. This church prayed for our family, hugged our necks. Both sides, me and Dana, holding us up. That's a picture of the body of Christ. That's how we win the battle. And I've got to tell you, some people have gotten the idea that they can just be a part of a church without being part of a church. And that's not the right way. That's not the Bible. The attack, the plan of the devil was to cut off the tail. You know what that means? That's an amputation. Look, I, I, I cut trees for a living. That's what I do. I juggle chainsaws. If I cut this hand off, I'm not just, it's not doing fine over there without me. That's an amputation. It won't make it without me. When there's a separation and a division in the body of Christ, that's an amputation. God has not called you to be a cut-off tail. Is that clear enough? There's no one with that calling. That's not spiritual. You say, well, I I'm spiritual. I'm reading my Bible, and I'm doing okay without, without the church. I don't need people around me praying for me, really. At the, event, at the end of Ephesians 6, Paul says, and also, while you're praying, pray for me that I could share the gospel, that I could have boldness, that I could have clarity, that I could bring the right words. You're not more spiritual than Paul. You're not. Maybe you are, okay. Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. The time of my betrayal is at hand. Peter, James, and John, could you just come and pray with me? That's Jesus. You're not more spiritual than Jesus. Why do we try to fight in our own power? Why do we try to fight all by ourselves when God has called us to be the church and we're supposed to lock arms and we're supposed to hold each other up when our arms are failing? We're supposed to restore each other with gentleness. We're supposed to pray over those who've gone the wrong way. And can I tell you, when I was younger, I went the wrong way. I'm going to close with this. When I, was, when I was 14, I was rebellious. And you don't know this, this side of me so much, but when I was 14, I knew more than my pastor. I rebelled against my pastor, and my pastor was my dad. Just like hitting the girl. I'm used to being wrong on multiple levels dishonoring my mother and my father and rejecting everything he told me. He said, go to school. I skipped school. Stole a three-wheeler, got my shoulder broke. He said, go to church. They brought me to Bogalusa Bible Conference, and they said, uh, maybe he'll get straightened out if he hears the word of God. Me and my friend Lane went and left the church service, walked around the corner to a gym. The guys playing ball in there had broken in. Next thing you know, I got handcuffed to my friend Lane. They put me in the squad car. I got arrested at church. Talk about rebellion. Just going the wrong way. One night I went out, supposed to go to a youth rally. I went to a bowling alley. I got in a fight. With several people at once. I got beat up so bad. My eyes were swollen shut. My nose was broken. My finger was bitten almost off. Middle of the night, my mom and dad show up. They said, Dylan, God has more for you than this. We've been praying for you. We love you. 
This is what the world wants for you. But God has a better life for you. And on the worst physical beating that I've ever gotten of my life, God won a spiritual battle. My parents won a spiritual battle over my whole life. Don't stop praying for your son. Don't stop praying for those who have gone the wrong way. It may not look like anything's going the right way, but the power of God can change their hearts in a way that you can't. We're called to fight for them. We're called to do battle, and the battle is the prayer room. The battle's right here at the altar. Moses made an altar and said, the Lord is my victory. The Lord is my banner. 